Father, we worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Our hands are uplifted, God. As the deer panteth for the water, so our hearts long for thee. Thank you for such demonstrations of your love and simple things. We all look for the miraculous, but it is in the simplicity of salvation, God, that you have performed your greatest miracle. We receive your grace and mercy as we come boldly before your throne this morning. Your people are hungry. They're here not to be seen or not to show off. They're here because they're hungry for you. Holy Spirit of the living God, I welcome your presence in this place. I ask your anointing to rest upon this service. Anoint me, your servant God, as I speak as an oracle of God. I am always surrendered to you in everything that I do and hope to accomplish. It is under your leading, the leading of the Holy Spirit. We thank you and we welcome you in this place. Can you say amen to that this morning? We welcome you. Certainly delighted that you're here this morning. I'm thankful for God being who he is. Amen. And that God is not moved emotionally on my behalf. Because if it had anything to do with emotions, I would be a wreck. And would be a hot mess in more cases than I'm willing to admit. I know it's true whether you say amen or not. You might not know the vernacular, but without God, we are nothing. But with God, all things are possible. Can you say amen to that this morning? I want to welcome our first-time guests. I've seen a few of you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, tuning in, well, I guess you're tuned in, really, because you're here. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you coming out, hanging out with us. Uh, we're here for one purpose, and that's to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so uh, I am delighted that you're here. We invite you to come back anytime. Uh, you know, at, at my request, at the leading of the Holy Spirit, I've asked our, our helps team to make sure that we can be more intimate, and you can see that today. Amen. Where y'all been? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Let's welcome our YouTube audience. This morning, we're grateful and thankful that you are uh, tuned in to us. We thank you that no matter when you see this, whether it's live stream or whether you see it next week, next month, next year, we pray that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would be upon it so that you would hear the word and it would transform your thinking and ultimately transform your life. We thank you. We are located at 1221st Avenue in the city of Coralville, Iowa, at the Radisson Hotel and Conference Center temporarily. But we welcome you. We've got a warm seat of welcome here for you. Please come down. Check us out. If you're in the local area, if not, tune in online. We love to have you comment. Just speak to us. We certainly are here to be a blessing to you. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome our YouTube audience this morning? Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Give me 45 minutes, please, if you would. I want to, last week I was talking to you from, I really went through a introduction, as it were, through Galatians, the first and second chapter. So some of you, if maybe you weren't here, you might feel a little lost or a little behind, but trust me. You can go back and review it, and we'll get you there as necessary. But this morning, I want to talk to you about something that the Lord has laid on my heart regarding uh, what actually takes place in the reality of a believer. The life of a believer is more than just what you and I think it is. And I can't go back and change the past, neither can you. But what I can do is ensure that my future is exactly what God desires for it to be. Can you say amen to that? Amen. One of the things that I found out that about Christianity, uh, I use my brother. Matter of fact, I was practicing this message today. I don't use these as readers, but I do use them for distance, but I'm going to take them off right now because I think they're going to be a distraction for me. Um, I, I was practicing this message in my kitchen. <laughs> Not because I had worked it up like that, but because I knew that there were some things that needed to be affirmed, and I've got my older brother uh, sitting in the audience today. I'm delighted and honored that he's here. Uh, he travels extensively and will be traveling again, but he's here, and it's a blessing to my life. Uh, I, I want to talk to you. Let's, let's read first, and then we'll get into this. How about that? Turn to Galatians, the second chapter, Galatians 2, verse 11, Galatians 2, verse 11, and this is where our study is coming from for most of this Next period, we're still talking about what, what is our prophetic theme for the year? Learning the, the potential in every seed in 2018. Your life is a seed. Say, my life is a seed. Say, my neighbor's life is a seed. Say, my children's lives are seeds. 
And so as a result of their lives or our lives being seeds, we have to know that there is a rich harvest coming, and most of us will not receive the best part of that harvest on this side of eternity. Right. Showing up at church and doing the things that are required or asked of you in a church setting are not necessarily going to benefit you as much as you would like them to do. It takes an extraordinary, uh, Dr. Savell, I use Dr. Savell's uh, language here, he says, you know, a rare breed of Christian who will do the extraordinary to get the things that come from heaven. And so you have to be determined, you have to have made up your mind, committed your life to the cause of Christ. Can you say amen to that? Not everybody's willing to pay that price and sadly the price has already been paid. It simply becomes a matter of obedience. And in a self-willed society, in a postmodern society where we have learned to be more self-conscious than any other generation, I believe, we had our ancestors, our ancestors fought in World War I and many died on the foreign battlefields, World War II. And we know our father, many of your predecessors, your ancestors fought in that great battle. But they were selfless in their determination to make sure that the, the, the great United States as they saw it, even with all of its racial disparity, even with all of its challenges, even with all of the economic woes, that this nation was worth fighting for. And it was more than just simply because we were called to battle, but they knew that there was something that God had planted in the United States of America. I know it's a political climate. I know, I know. Ain't nobody wants to say amen to that because I ain't happy about America because I live here, but my president is a jerk. That's what you might say. I'm just saying, I'm just filling in the blanks for you. Y'all ain't got to say amen this morning because I'm going to keep preaching this morning. With the reality of it is, is that God has caused you to be exactly where he wants you to be at this time and season of your life. And most people, because they cannot see the end from the beginning, they think that somehow or another, I, they have a better plan to get where they need to go. And I'm going to tell you what, I've learned, I've learned through the years of experience and growing up, you know, growing up in the church, as I started to say, growing up in the church, they taught us what they knew, but it wasn't always right. Yeah. Let's go to Galatians 2, verse 11. Do you have it? If you have it, say amen. amen. From the King James Version, it says, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I would stood him to the face because he was to be, say, blamed. blamed. Verse 12, for before that certain came from from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. We can translate that word circumcision to law keepers. Can we do that? Verse 13 says, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas, Paul's preaching buddy, Paul's partner in the gospel, also was carried away with their dissimulation. 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, in other words, right in the face of everybody, yeah. Paul called Peter out to the, to the task. Yeah. Can you say amen? amen? He says, to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why do you, I'm going to add this word, do you compel the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Verse 15, we who are Jews by nature. Can I tell you that you are not Jews by nature unless you are born into a Jewish lineage, but you are Jews by the Spirit. I didn't get enough amens, but that is true. We are Jews by the Spirit, not by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles. Verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Good place to say amen. Even when we have believed, even we, excuse me, have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified, say justified, justified, by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, but by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Verse 17, but, say but. but. Many people get stuck right here and don't even know it because they live their lives stuck right here without being able to articulate the gospel message. They get stuck right here. Because he says here in verse 17, but if we, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I'm reading down to the 21st verse. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. This morning, the question is, are you crucified with Christ? 
I am, he says. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, in other words, I haven't lost anything by being crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I don't know what you do in your Bible. You want to highlight that, mark it, underline it, whatever. That is a scripture, a passage of scripture you need to keep in the forefront of your thinking for the rest of your life on earth. He says, Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So much there, so much there. I'll keep going. Who loved me and gave himself for me. He loved Tommy. I don't know about you. I don't know about you. He loves me. Because he looked in the middle of what I was and called me what I needed to be. And he did not just call me, he led me by the hand. Isn't that right? He led me by the hand to get where I needed to go so that the, at the end of my life, I could be acceptable unto him. Amen. Verse 21 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Let's talk this morning. I want to talk to you just a little while. And again, I, I told you this, uh, uh, and I'm just going to just jump in here if that's okay, and I'll pick up some other things as the Lord gives me grace to do it. Um, Growing up in upstate New York, uh, we grew up uh, in, in a couple different churches. Auburn's First Church of God in Christ was located in Auburn, New York. I know I talk fast. Stay with me. I want to get done with this, okay? Uh, Pastor um, um, Ernest J. Matthews was such a prolific man of God. He, worked, he was a bivocational pastor. He worked at uh, an auto plant there in that area. And me and my siblings, of which I'm the youngest, my father made a decision to drive us from Geneva, New York, and then, it, then uh, Romulus, New York, to be a part of this church was a significant difference, I mean, uh, distance to get there. And so my mama would used to get us up early in the morning, and actually the night before, we would make preparation to go. So we'd make preparation to go, and I know I'm old school here, but that's okay. My dad used to say, new school can't tell old school. He changed it. I'm changing a little bit because I don't want to throw y'all. So, so but with, that, with that being said, uh, I learned something about God. And what I learned about God as a young boy, I began to apply to my life. Most of you, this is not your first go around. How many of you in this place, would you raise your hands by confirmation that this is the first church you've ever been a part of? Would you raise your hands, please? Raise your hands so people can see. Look around the room. Okay. Praise God. Give her a hand. With that being said, that means that most of you have acquired knowledge outside of this place. And that knowledge that you have, and I'm, we're right here in the book of Galatians, the knowledge that you have doesn't necessarily line up with the gospel or the word of God. And you have to be careful that your intellect, your capability, your, your, your ability to, de to, to decipher text and, and comprehend uh, passages and paragraphs and all of these things does not conflict with what God's word actually is saying to you. Amen. And I submit to you this morning that what you think you are, you may not necessarily be. And many people that I find in the church, they struggle with true identity. Identity does not come from what your last name is. <laughs> Identity doesn't come from what your first name is. Identity comes, the Apostle Paul says, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of Jesus Christ. So your identity comes from Jesus Christ, from him, through him, beyond him, and forever him. That is who you are. Now, that's a tremendous premise because what, what is happening in the Galatian church at this time or in the church there, what is happening is that there are people that have come in and they have been, this is a new church. This is a new reformation. You know, I'm learning that eight years in ministry is not as, as, as long or as old as I thought it would be. Okay, I'll just keep going. So, so with that being said, one of the things that God has impressed upon my heart as we study this, the Apostle Paul's responsibility here is to refute heresy, is to shut down false beliefs. Many of us have been taught and have believed that because we do something, God is pleased with us. 
I wish I could get some response. Here. Because we show up, God is pleased. Because we're still married, even though we don't like our spouse, God is pleased. Because we somehow or another have decided that we are tithers and givers and, and we, we, we give alms and we go down and help the poor, that God is pleased. God is not pleased or displeased because you cannot displease a God who has no capacity to uh, address you emotionally. That's important to know because, see, see what happens is if I, if I look at my, my life over the past 55 and a half years to this point, I've done more bad than I have good. I'll try this out over here. I ain't. In 55 and a half years, I'm just now hitting a stride where I understand that God loves me so much that he didn't care what I was going to do in the future. He only understood that his plan for my life was important enough to send Jesus Christ. And in a, in, in a church setting, what we have to do is we have to get above and beyond this judgmental, critical, always observing somebody else's false spirit and recognize that none of us has ever been made perfect except through Jesus Christ. Amen. You don't bring anything to the table to make God better. The only thing we can do is receive the fullness of his free gift of salvation, which comes from his son. Can you say amen to that? So the Apostle Paul, in encountering Peter, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I want, to, I want to just say a couple things to you and you go from there. So this passage, as it is, this passage, you have to understand that Paul addresses with Peter, and I want you to write this down, his inconsistencies and his double-mindedness. Peter shows himself to be double-minded. I don't know. I don't know. The Bible is not real clear on why Peter was there at that church, whether it was by invitation or whether it was by he just wanted to go and observe because Paul and Barnabas were new to the call. We talked about that last week because uh, because Paul and Barnabas were, let me some water, please. Because Paul and Barnabas were new to the call. I don't know what prompts Peter to come. If you know, maybe you can share it with me. But but with that being said, he comes and the Apostle Peter, listen to me now, the Apostle Peter is, has, hallelujah, has learned from the time Jesus encountered him when he first walked up to his boat, he has learned that what is happening and has happened through Jesus Christ is just what he says in John 10, that I have come to give you life and that more abundantly. Yes. Now, the life of God happens in Jesus Christ. Thank you. The life of God happens through Jesus Christ. Excuse me. And what happens is Peter is the recipient of that. And what Peter does is he starts out by being and acknowledging that he is a sinful man. Too many in our society don't want to acknowledge that they are actually sinful people. I hate to bust your bubble. I don't care whether you got, you know, all these different accolades, you've achieved all this stuff. I am in need of a savior because Tommy Roberts has been a sinful man. Now, I'm no longer a sinful man, but I have been a sinful man. Okay, let's not get it twisted. Let's make sure we understand what we're talking about here. So Peter is encountering Jesus at a level where Jesus comes to him. I talked about this last week. I'm going to go through it fast. He comes up to his boat, and there are more boat options there, but he chooses Peter and says, Peter, listen, would you take me out here and put me out here where I can talk to the people? And so in, in going and talking to the people, Peter is frustrated because Peter's a fisherman. He spends his time on the water. It is his livelihood. And he's like, well, OK, well, I'll go out. I'm cleaning my nets. You kind of interrupted me. I'm kind of busy, Lord. I got a life. You know what I'm saying? I got other things to do. I don't even know who you are because you have not validated yourself. And until God validates himself in your life, you will always be out of time for God. You will always be frustrated by the things that God asks you to do because he has not somehow or another not been made real to you. But once God is real to you, the Bible says, the Apostle Paul says that, that my little children whom I travail again in birth until Christ be formed in you. See, what we need is we need Christ formed in us. In, in 2018, we've kind of had this, this gospel where somehow or another it's just easy to pursue God. I've never known it to be easy. So Peter is now waiting for the confirmation. He doesn't say it. He's smart enough to say it. Most of us, we know the lingo because we know we won't say, we won't say that, you know, well, I'm not sure. But in, in the church setting, we'll say, amen, hallelujah. 
Glory be to God. I have faith and so on and so forth, whatever the chatter is. But it is not in the time of refreshing that happens in this place. It is in the life challenges that happen from Sunday evening until Saturday night that the true test of who you are and whether you really know God happens in your life. So Peter encounters Jesus and Jesus says, listen, push out a little bit. I'm paraphrasing. Don't hold me to it technically if you do something's wrong with you. Anyway, so we go out here and Peter is there and Peter says, you know, I've toiled all night. But Jesus said, I want you to launch out into the deep. I want you to throw your net. And Peter throws out the net and he is an experienced fisherman who knows all of the vernacular and the methodology and all of the systems and what it means to catch fish and harvest fish. But somehow or another, God is getting ready to show him a new reality. But until God can change his mind about who he is, he can't show him a thing. So he harvests the fish. You guys know the story. Now, this is the same Peter who in the book of Acts was there and he was on the top of the house and fell into a trance. And in his trance, he saw something that he just could not believe. And that was that that God, he ultimately says that I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. And all of the things that he saw there, you can study for yourself. Now, moving forward now, this same Peter who stands there with John, the, 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 the beloved of God, and, and, and walks up to the temple one day. This is the same Peter that stood up on the day of Pentecost and began to pronounce that you, children, you are the ones who crucified this master. You are the ones who put him to a death. He began to tell them that these are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour. But he begins to tear, declare that this is the power of the Holy Ghost that is moving. Moving among the people of God. Can I tell you that the power of the Holy Ghost is still moving on the people of God? And whether or not you accept it, whether or not you, you think yourself, you know, I don't know about all that. Well, that's you, but I'm here to tell you that if you're not careful, you might miss the thing that God wants to do in your life. He walks up now and this Peter now he heals, gets it. He lays his hands on this same this same Peter who shadow my God. Hold, hold, help, help us, Lord. This same Peter who comes. And he encounters Paul. Listen to me now. Paul is there and Paul is not, although he had the uh, educational capacity, he did not have the apostolic authority that Paul had. Are you with me this morning? He didn't have the, the you know, he sat at the, at the feet one, one, one word says, one pastor says, at the feet of Gamaliel, who was the Foremost teacher, it's like going to Harvard. Sorry, all you Iowa grads, I'm just saying. It, it, it was like being at Harvard, Harvard, the Harvard of the day or the Stanford of the day or whatever. And, and Paul sat at that seat. But it was not that what he encountered from Gamaliel that taught him who he was. It was the encounter on the Damascus Road that Paul encountered Jesus and his life was forever transformed. And so he says, I have nothing to offer. Lord, what would you have me to do? And in our churches, we get intimidated to ask people what we want you to do. Do you not know that your eternal reward is based on what God has you do in this life? Help me somebody. Yes, sir. I ain't got time. I'm be honest with you. Can I be honest? I don't care. I'm gonna be honest anywhere, whether you like me or not, afterwards really doesn't matter to me. I don't have time to pastor a church. In my natural life, Reverend Fairies, I don't have time. In my soul life where my mind, will, and emotions dwell, and whether or not it's fun, I don't have time. Can I tell you that it doesn't matter what you think you have to do that's more important. The only thing that's going to last is what you do for God. I know, I know, I know. We've come across a generation that has found themselves right in the crossroads and the, and, and the crosshairs of the devil, but the crossroads of Christianity and the world. And somehow or another, you have heard the gospel preached unto you. You have heard the life-giving power, the power that flows from the blood of Jesus. There is a fount, oh my God, that flows from the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the power of God flowing. The blood of Jesus, it never loses its power and yet somehow or another I am not convinced because my situation doesn't line up with what you said preacher and so Peter comes and 
he's there. And Paul, he, I have to believe that Peter was not expecting Paul to walk in the room that day. Peter's there and listen to me now. Come on, listen to me. Listen to me. Peter's there and he encounters a religious gathering kind of like what we got today. And Peter, <laughs> Peter is up here to be clear. Come on now. He's not the pope of the church. Come on now. Get that thinking out, Joe. It's thinking, thinking. He is, however, the authorized spokesman of God. He is the voice that more recognize his voice than they do James. Although James is the half brother of Jesus and James speaks prolifically for the church. He is the leader of the established church. But Peter is out there in the midst when Peter was in in the jail. He was he was down there and imprisoned. The Bible says that the church went into prayer for Peter. And it talks about this little sister by the name of Rhoda. And they prayed and they believed God. Yeah. Most of our churches don't pray anymore. We can't get people to pray more than just a few moments. You know, and if we do pray, many times we pray for ourselves rather than the kingdom of God to be advanced. I know I'm walking this morning. And so what God desires to do is teach us how to pray again. We're not so sophisticated and so, so, so advanced that we don't need the same power that comes from prayer through Jesus Christ, the heavenly intercessor. Because we do have this enemy called, he is the, he is the accuser of the brethren. And he's, as he withstood Peter and Paul and Jesus, he is withstanding you and I every day. So the church goes into a prayer mode. Too many times our churches want revival, but they don't want to be awakened. You don't get revival just because you say it. Something's going to cost you here. It's going to cost you something here. It's going to cost you your TV time, your Facebook time. It's probably going to cost you your meal time. I'm not saying all of it, but I'm saying part of it. You have to be willing to go to the, to the, to the mat, as I say. You got to go to the mat, as it were, and say, God, I need you more. Then what, what, look, God, this don't look right. This is not right. Our churches are failing. Our preachers are committing suicide. My husband is left. My wife is gone. Something's not right, God. My children are deserting you. My God. God, where are you? So, so, so Paul doesn't have all of that. He, he is just the guy that has encountered Jesus. And so Peter's there and he's eating. <laughs> you fill in the blank. Let's say it, it ain't legal. <laughs> Somebody said chicken. Pork spare ribs and chitlins and ham hocks and Bacon, ham. He he having a good time. Can't you just see all that stuff just dripping off his beard? And he just smacking. I got some brothers that smack. He not one of them, but we got brothers in our family that smack. You ever heard somebody smack? I mean, don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about smack. I'm talking about make so much noise when they eating it just make you want to stop eating forever. I'm like, look, if that's the only way you can eat that thing, can you please close your mouth when you eat? I'm talking about smackers. I got some smackers in my family. <laughs> and so do you. I hope you're not that one. <laughs> so Peter is having a good time. Listen, now there's something here. I don't want you to miss this. I want you to understand this. And Peter's having a good time. He, oh God, help me, Jesus. He is allowed by God to have the good time. Eating pork. Yes. Come on now. Come on now. Now his Jewish training taught him not to touch that. Mm. But see, outside, in, the, in the absence of your training, in the absence of your religious heritage and your upbringing, if you came up in the Church of God in Christ or the Baptist or the Methodist or the, the Lutheran or the Episcopalian or the Presbyterian, no matter what you came up under, it is not necessarily equated to the life that you find in God. God does not prohibit, oh God help me, does not prohibit things that pertain to life and godliness. Rather, he gives you all things that pertain to life and godliness. And what he says to you, you and I, ladies and gentlemen, with your brilliant minds, you have me on board. I can show you what you should and should not do. Amen. Peter forgot that. Paul walks in the room. 
Hey! Hey, 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 hey! Now, Peter was the authoritative person according to the church. And Barnabas, Paul's preaching buddy, <laughs> was sitting right side by side. They were smacking down. And Paul did not, listen, listen to me, please. Paul did not condemn him because he ate the meat. He condemned him because he played, he played it off. He tried to act like he didn't do that. Oh, how much time I got? It, it, is not, it is not that thing which you did last night. It's how you act today. It ain't that movie that you watch. It ain't, it ain't, it ain't. Oh, help me, God. We're going to have to pull in some religious toes now. Cause, cause he, cause, see, because the only reason why God has got me on this vein because he's trying to get this fruit of the Spirit grown up in you. And once that thing begins to grow in you, and by the way, it is nine manifestations of one fruit. It is not nine separate fruits. It is the different manifestations of it. But with that being said, see, what, what, what we do and what we've learned, they used to tell us, say, you know what? Don't, don't go out there, uh, 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 old, old term, shucking and jiving. Don't go out there acting a fool, acting crazy on Saturday night and coming to the house of God. Because when you do that, they call you what? Who said that? A hypocrite. Was Peter a hypocrite? Was he? In his activity and in his mind? Absolutely, yes. In his deception? Yes. But in the heart of God? Mm. He was the same man that came through the bloodline of Jesus. He was the same man that walked upon the water, even though he sank. He was the same man that cut off the guard's ear. He was the same man that stood up on the day of Pentecost. And all God was waiting for was for Peter to recognize that he wasn't mad because of what he did. He was mad because he didn't open his mouth and say, Father, forgive me. And most of us stay right there, stuck on what we did. See, see, the thing about Jesus, Jesus did not come to abolish the law. He didn't come to put the law uh, uh, in, under condemnation. He came to put the law in its proper place, which was, say the word, fulfilled. Thank you, Father. Mm. Come on, just pray with me right now. Come on, Father, we love you. I'm going to tell you. Look up at me. Come on, Mr. It is a great. I don't. I didn't. I don't ask for these assignments, but I find myself right here. Some of y'all gonna go unless you have, unless you have taken time to. I said this at a meeting the other night that we had at our home. Unless you have taken time to connect with God. I didn't say pray. I didn't say fast. All those things help you connect, but you got to know who God is. And as much as that, you got to know who you are in him. Because what I'm getting ready to say, what I'm getting ready to say is, 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 is it has the potential to be a church breaker. But I got to say it because that's why God brought me here. And no matter how long it takes, I'm going to say it as long as I have breath in my lungs. God is not as concerned about your sin as you are. As a matter of fact, he don't care. Look, see, I see it on your faces. He don't care about your sin. He does not care about your sins. He is more concerned about your consistency than your sin. Whenever you try to build a life of success, it has to be built on a platform of consistency. 
If your word is no good, then neither are you. It is one thing to claim, claim Philippians 4.13. Somebody tell me what that says, please. 4.12.13. Right? Okay. Now, with that being said, you can't do all things if you're not, if you are double-minded in your thinking. Double-mindedness comes from a lack of understanding of who God is. Case in point, case in point. When God dealt with David and Bathsheba, now we always, Nathan the prophet faulted David, did he not? Yes. Rightfully so, at God's direction. He was to be faulted. Can I tell you why David was to be faulted? Because he was out of position. He should have been on the battle lines with his troops instead of being back there, kicked back, enjoying life. Because his, call, listen, his calling required more responsibility than he was willing to give. Many of us, our, calling requires, our callings require more responsibility than we're willing to give. And the reason why you have not advanced in your calling is because you will not accept responsibility. Isn't that right? You can't be a business owner and have employees under your charge and not show up for work. They need to get paid. I'm going to tell you something else they need that the body of Christ needs. They need correction. Because it's your business that God gave you. And they don't have the right to run it outside of your authority. And what the church does is the church has been somehow or another relegated to this lack of, of, of consciousness regarding spiritual authority. So we think we can do anything and we're going to be blessed. Well, preacher, doesn't it say, according to Galatians 3.19, that the blessing of the Lord, you know, yeah, he, I know it says that. It says that for curses everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of the Lord would come upon them, right? So the reality of it, though, is that there is an obedience factor that must be fulfilled in order for God to do what he's called, uh, uh, called upon your life in order for it to manifest. But, but most of us are hung up on our lack of consistency, or in this case, your sin consciousness. And so I want to show you my desire and my, my endeavor is to show you that God is not concerned about what you did. I said this last week. I went back and watched it to make sure I said it right by the leading of the Holy Ghost. And I know, I know, I know. And you're thinking, you're thinking, you know, but you don't know what I did. His grace is greater than your sin. The capacity for his grace is greater than the capacity for yours and I sin. Come on now. If he paid the price through Jesus Christ for our lives to, to, be the, the, to be the sacrifice for sin, don't sit there and tell me that whatever you did is greater than what he has already done. You are a liar. And you need to repent for lying. Uh, it needs to be a jumping and shouting message, amen. <laughs> Jump, 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 jump. Let's look at one more thing, and I'll let you go. Hallelujah. So let me read this just for a little bit. Is that all right? Can I take a few more minutes? So we talked about double-mindedness and inconsistency. When Peter came up short, if you look at his life, he came up short because of his own double-mindedness. Real quick, going back to the walking on the water, this man, I challenge you to do the same, Walked on the water. Everybody concentrates on the fact that Peter sank and Jesus had to lift him up, but he did walk on the water. When did he start sinking? When he became double-minded. Taking your eyes off Jesus is the same as being double-minded. The Bible says that he that hath begun a good work in you is faithful to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So it is God who has started the work in you. What you have to do is make sure that you stay in fellowship or connected with God. Isn't that right? Yeah. Stop trying to make it happen. Yeah. I ain't trying to make it happen. Yeah. I ain't trying to grow this church. I am not trying to grow this church. Now, I wish I could say that I haven't, I've always been in this position. I go through ebbs and flows like you do. I'm to the point now where, you know what, it's just too tiring. If you don't want the word, you're in the wrong place. If you're not hungry for God, you're in the wrong place. If you're just going to come here for a show, you're in the wrong place. Amen. 
Okay, let me keep going. Let me, let me, let me, let me shut this thing down. I want, to, I want to just say this with you, okay? Justification is only by faith. Right? So, this is verses 15 through 16. You can just mark it in your Bibles. A believer is justified by faith alone. Okay? Now, the Apostle Paul was a what? What was he? A Jew. Come on, say he was a Jew. He was a Jew by nature, of course, and that was by birth. But he also was what kind of citizen? A Roman citizen. That's important. Because you and I have the same calling on our lives as, as what God really destined for the Apostle Paul. You know, I can say that I'm African American by birth, right? But I am a U.S. citizen, not by my own choosing. Now, if I, as I expand my thinking and get into the place where God wants me to be, he begins to show me that, that being an African American by birth is insignificant. Being a Caucasian of European descent is insignificant. Being Asian, African, Middle Eastern by birth is insignificant. And yet it is these things that we ascribe most of our, our importance and significance to. Come on now, y'all getting quiet on me. I'm finishing. What he does now is he brings us into a place of understanding that by virtue of covenant relationship, yes. he simply says that I am giving you my identity and my life yes. through Jesus Christ, Galatians 2.20. I'm giving you who I am, and if you can renew your mind and see yourself as I see you, there is nothing that you won't accomplish in the earth. And what the devil does is he tries to put a spin on gender identification. Close your Bibles. I'm finishing. Close your Bibles. Close your Bibles. Because if I see your Bible open, I'm going to want to open mine. Yeah, I don't want me to open mine. He tries to put a spin on. I'm here now, okay? He tries to put a spin on the hashtag Me Too movement. He tries to put a spin on Black Lives Matter movement. He tries to put a spin on now White Lives Matter movement. He tries to put, this is the enemy, he tries to put emphasis on the things that you and I are most familiar with. I'm familiar with being a black man by birth. I didn't choose it. I think if I had a choice, I would have chose it. I got more rhythm than my white brothers sometimes. I ain't getting no amen. I better watch out. I better walk. <laughs> but but, but, but if, 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 if I look at it from the other perspective, y'all going to just have to deal with me this morning, okay? Y'all just going to have to deal with me. Because, see, some of my brothers and sisters, I don't say in this room, but y'all know somebody like this. They're more concerned with phones and cars and, and, and more, more concerned with the things they have rather than the things that they can possess to create wealth and influence in the earth. So, so if I had it, if the Lord said, "Eeny, meeny, miny, mo," black, white, Asian, in, in in one capacity, I might choose the European per, European persuasion, because there, I might perceive it to be able to give me more inroads. And, and and where whereas I'm not going to go to the country club as an African American, not by not by discrimination, but by choice. I don't know nobody there, so some would say you need to know somebody. There. But as a European, I might be drawn to something that my daddy gave me in terms of inheritance or in terms of, 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 of an understanding of wealth, management, uh, a, a will, or whatever the case is. That might be something that I ascribe in importance to. Come on, y'all get quiet on me. Y'all get quiet on me. I thought y'all were ready for this. 
I thought y'all were ready for this. I thought you were ready for this. Y'all stuck on white and black. I'm telling you, that's the whole problem. That's the whole problem with the church today. They stuck on white or black or Asian. If I, as an Asian, I have such intellect and the capacity to do things that are technical and to be able to do things that at, that at a level that my, my, my North American brothers and sisters can't do or my, my Middle Eastern brothers and sisters can't I might choose to be an Asian if God gave me the choice. But he didn't give you the choice. The only choice you have is to live for Christ. The only choice you and I have is to die with Christ. The only choice you get is to live. How? Come on, somebody. Is to allow myself to be that sacrificial seed that God can use to bring about a multitude. Hey, listen, I don't care. Somebody might say to you, stand up, Dr. Marshall. Somebody might say to you, well, you know, I know you're a doctor and all that. But you would say, you know what? I don't care about being no doctor, baby. Yeah, she would say it like that, wouldn't she? You sit down. I don't care what you think about. The only thing I care about is the fact that the Lord has transplanted me to Iowa. It wasn't even on my agenda. It wasn't on my map. It wasn't geographically convenient for me. But God in his wisdom, like the Apostle Paul, decided that he was going to send him into a place that was difficult on the outside, but had great reward on the inside. And most of us get stuck right in that in-between place. Do you know what I mean by that in-between place? The Bible says, John 12, 24, Jesus said that except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, in the death process, it begins to shed things that you don't need anymore. Some of us have not allowed us. We're too stuck on what we think we need and we pursue that rather than the thing that we do need, which is him and him crucified. It is Christ in me, the power of the living God. The anointing of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost, the living God inside of me. And in his power, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can overcome the devil. I know the devil's mad at me on the job. I know the devil's ha hating on me because, you know, I walk in with a smile. I know the devil's wanting to split up my marriage, but by the authority of God, he can't have my life. Can't have my babies. Can't, can't have my son. Can't have my daughter. Can't have my kids. Can't have them. It's power. The Bible says there's power. Old song says power. Power. Wonder working power. In the blood of the Lamb. Some of us are too concerned about what we look like. We need to be concerned about walking around in the blood of Jesus. Allow the blood of Jesus back in our homes. Study on it. Meditate on it. The apostle Paul, when he was slain in the spirit, fell down. All of his dignity was down. All of his respect was down. He was embarrassed in front of his team that was there. He heard voices, my God, that they didn't hear. But he was down in the power of God. And if we would allow ourselves to go down in the power of God and get up in his victory. Get up in his victory. Rise up and take back what belongs to you. Our schools belong to the king. Our homes belong to the king. We've been shedding for too much anymore, baby. Our marriages belong to God. But not if you don't know who you are. Sit down, sit down. Sit down. Hallelujah. One of my most favorite passages of scripture, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but that's okay. It's found further on in, the, in, in that same book. The Apostle Paul talks about drifting away from God. It is easy in this generation to drift away from God. If you don't put an anchor down, if you ever been in a boat, you don't put an anchor down. I don't care if the water looks calm. And many of us have been, have, have been relying on calm waters because our checkbook is long enough. We, we, we've been relying on calm waters because we got a good job. But when the storm hits the water, your boat is still on the water. The, but the God of the water is inside of you. So you can't allow yourself to get comfortable in Zion. Yes, sir. Stand to your feet. 
Complacency is a killer. It is a slow erosion. Slow erosion of the foundation. Hallelujah. Forgive me. I have to go back and look exactly which church it was in the book of Revelation. Apostle, you may know. You can help anybody. Jesus begins to talk to the churches in Revelation. Y'all remember that? And he didn't say he hated them, didn't say he was mad at them, but he said, I have aught against you. One of the churches in particular was built upon a high fortress. And they were secure because no enemy could penetrate because of the height of them. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the United States of America has been so high on itself, have been so flattered and enamored with our own ability to speak in tongues have been so captured by the praise and worship and how professional it is, have been turned off because it's not what I want. And so in that, though, that church that sat there, they got lazy and forgot to manage the foundation. Many of us have forgotten to manage our foundation. Oh, help me, Lord. When I say manage, I mean tend to it, pay attention to it. We've we've allowed homosexuality to get real close to us without saying, no, that's not of God. We've allowed liars in our midst and not have challenged them because we don't want to offend them. Better I offend you and by telling you the truth than placate you by causing you to kind of just be okay in your unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus for your life will not be held on my hands. Hallelujah. Mm. And so what began to happen was a slow erosion around the base. Crevices began to form. I'll find it for you if I need to, but I know I'm right about it. And, And the crevices began to grow wider. And the enemies that would not try to climb high, God, had no problem hitting them low. And the Bible says through, through the prophet Solomon that it is the little foxes that destroy the vine. It is those little things that you have just acclimated to and allowed to be a part of your life, even though they are not of God. They slip it. And what the enemy did is the crevices got so wide, they didn't even have to bend down anymore. They could just walk in. And they walked in. And they gathered their forces to come against this church that was in a high place. I believe that our greatest days of the church are ahead of us. I believe that. But not without tribulation. Not without tests and trials. I wonder, are we prepared for fortified against hardness and adversity this morning? I want you to lift your hands in the presence of God. I'm not finished, but I got to end, so. It is not my responsibility, it is not your responsibility to check your neighbor's foundation. That's called judgmentalism. And it morphs into a critical spirit. If I don't like what you're doing, I need to take it to God. And when I take it to God, by the Holy Spirit, he will give me instruction on how to take it to you. But too many people want to point fingers and say, well, you know, she not right because I saw you. Well, how could you see her if you weren't out there? Come on, just lift your hands in his presence. Father, we thank you. Give you praise. I don't know what to do, Father. I don't know what to do other than listen to you. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do other than listen to you. And I trust you're leading. Move this, please. Move this. I want to open this place up this morning. Anybody that doesn't know Jesus, I'm tired of just preaching messages that sound good and make you feel good. You need to know Jesus. I said you need to know Jesus. 
I said, you need to know Jesus. You need to know him, not just his name, not just, you know, the Greek. In it. You need to know him. You need to know him on such a close, personal level that no matter what comes in your life, you ain't backing up. You're not turning around. Tonight we have a baptism service. We'll do that tonight, what, six o'clock, I think it is. And there are people that were baptized last year this time and have already fallen away. Are you feeling me this morning? This is not a game that we play. This is life. This is the crossroads, the intersection of life. And it is the hub. It is the place where Jesus has still chosen. People say, well, I don't need the church. That's your problem. You think you know more than the church. Thank you for your enthusiasm over that revelation. But what you need to know is that Jesus has decided, yes, there's other avenues to come into. I'm not suggesting that the church is the only one, but you still need to find a church, a strong place of refuge, protection, fellowship, and community. Those of you that might be watching by YouTube and you haven't chosen a church, I don't know what you're waiting on. I'm not talking about just life points. You need to have a local church. Well, they're not this. That's your problem. Because you want to look at it from what they are not instead of who God has said they are. God doesn't use the same criteria of judgment as you do. You don't have a right to pick and choose. Only by the power of the Holy Ghost can you be successful in your life. And that means that you're going to have to submit somewhere, sometime. This morning, if you don't know Jesus, if you've never accepted him, let me tell you how, let me tell you how this, this, this whole process works. Rather than me just calling you front, I'm going to do it. But it's not just me calling you forward. It is a power of, of the Holy Ghost that brings what we call conviction or it brings an awareness to your life that how you are is not good enough to make it into heaven. Now, I don't say that from those, for those of you that are born again, if you're still thinking that, one or two things. You either need to repent or you weren't saved in the first place. I stand before you having admitted that I am not perfect. I don't try to be. What I am is forgiven. <laughs> I definitely try to be that. So if that's you, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, Dr. Winston says, what if you, you know what I'd do if I wasn't born again? What would I do? If I wasn't saved, what would I do? When would I do it? Right now. There's nothing holding you back. Now, I'm going to tell you part two of that as you come. I'm going to tell you part two of that. Part two of that is that this is the best life I have ever lived after accepting Jesus Christ as Lord. There's absolutely nothing off limits. There's nothing off the table. People say, well, wait a minute. There's nothing on the table. You can do it. No, it's not that I can't do it. It's that I don't want to do it. I don't want to cheat on my wife. I don't want to. Don't have the desire. I don't want to steal something. I don't want to cheat on my taxes. <laughs> okay. What is that going to do for my family? Well, first thing you have to do is make the decision. If you make the decision, God will back your decision, not just with himself, but with all of the force of heaven behind you to make you successful. Are you going to fall? Absolutely. You're going to fall. You're going to trip. You're going to miss it. We all do. Everybody in this room has done that. You're not too young. You're not too old. You just have to make the decision. Is there anybody this morning? Praise God. Well, I want to extend this to somebody who maybe feels and believes, say feels very loosely, that they need to repent. Hmm. Hmm. Repent. As in turn around. That's what it means. Turn around. Turn around. I've been walking, Pastor Tommy. I've been, you know, I love Jesus, but I ain't really been showing that. And so I've allowed other things to take the priority of my life other than him. And that's more subtle than you and I realize, but today, if that's you, I want you to come this morning. Come on. Don't be shy. Don't let, don't let the pressures of what people think about you and, and all those things. Come on. Come on. 
in every service that I've, that I've had opportunity to preach and minister, and I know there's always one or two, but I always know that the pull of that, and depending on the size of the crowd, is always a factor in people's coming forth. Can I tell you this? Can I tell you this regarding the size of the crowd? When you get to heaven, the size of the crowd ain't gonna matter. It ain't gonna matter. It is not gonna matter. <laughs> The only thing that matters is that on this 30th day of September 2018, you said, you know what? Forget y'all. I got to do this for me and God. Amen. All right. All right. Lift your hands to the, in the presence of the Lord. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. I pray for these men and women of God who have come, the beloved of Jesus, who have yielded themselves to the power of the Holy Spirit and sat patiently and listened as thus saith the Lord unto them. I pray that their ears and their eyes of their understanding would be enlightened to know the hope of your glory. I thank you, Father, that you are there with them. doesn't matter where they're at, where they're going, you are there. I pray that they would be so convicted by the power of the Holy Ghost, not made guilty, but convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit, that they would simply cry out to you in the night season, in the afternoon, God, when they would lounge upon their beds, let them cry out to you and say, God, God, I love you. Jesus, you are my Lord. Holy Spirit, you are my closest friend and my truest confidant. Lord, if they can't say that unto you, I pray that the convicting power of the Holy Ghost would fall on them and that they would run back unto you. Whether it comes through Life Point or any other place, God, let them run to you and let them be restored. I come against, Lord God, the spirit of condemnation and of an unrenewed mind that causes people to think less of themselves than you think of us. I know how you see me, God. You don't see me in any other light other than the light of Jesus Christ. Yes, I admit my sins. I confess my sins before you according to 1 John 1, 8 and 9. But you don't stop loving me. And you don't withdraw and withhold your love or your power from me. Give all of us the grace to overcome each challenge that we will face on this week. We give you praise. We expect to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. 